but we actually just have 15 minutes left. Maybe I'll, I'll stop early today so we don't run over time, but let's see um, how far we get. So that's exactly, I think, what you, you've been talking about. So cell-based location means I determine what network cells I'm currently uh, receiving, and then I use some kind of database to look up where these cells actually are. Um, there are several factors uh, which, which influence how well this works. So, um, of course, you need a database of high quality to actually determine where each cell tower or each access point is. Then the cells usually have quite different shape and size, and also the, the signal quality may be quite different at times. So, in theory, if you have such a kind of, of network cell, then it's, it's circular. So you have a transmitter and you have a, a circular area where you can actually receive it. Uh, if you plan like a network structure for a, for a city, um, then for, for planning purposes, the cells are assumed to be hexagonal. Um, and in reality, due to shielding and so on, they're actually quite irregular. So you can't assume that it's really just a circle. Um, in general, what, uh, what's done is that if you have neighboring cells here like this, then they're on different frequencies, so you don't get too much interference. That's pretty easy with the hexagonal ones, but of course, if you have a big building somewhere in the way, then you might get some, some shadow, for example, where you don't get any signal at all, of course. Um, so for Wi-Fi, a cell is maybe something between 10 and 100 meters. Uh, depending on what router you have, it may even be just one single room in the building. Then with uh, 3G in cities, you have something between maybe 100 meters for very small cells and perhaps five kilometers for the largest ones. Um, and with the old 2G, you actually can have cells up to 35 kilometers because they have a, it has a longer range due to the uh, um, uh, due to the more robust modulation basically. Um, so the cell can be can be pretty large. Um, and what's mostly used now for this kind of cell-based location determination are these three factors. So I'm just looking at what cell is my device currently connected to. Um, then sometimes what sector of the, of the cell is my device using. Some uh, Wi-Fi usually doesn't have that. UMTS and GSM usually have different sectors. And I'm also looking at what other cells could I uh, receive right now. So what's still in reception range. Um, there are other factors which I might be able to use, like signal strength. So how far am I from the cell? What angle do I get? Uh, and the time difference. We already talked about why time difference isn't used in this case because it's just too variable and to get it accurate I would have to spend a lot of money. Can anyone think of a reason, for example, if I know the angle of arrival then I could basically triangulate. Why isn't this used uh, in mobile devices? Does anyone have an idea? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So for that reason, the antennas in mobile devices, if you remember from last lecture, antennas have different reception patterns. And for the very reason that we move it around a lot, the antennas are optimized to receive uh, as well as possible from any direction. Um, but to actually triangulate, to pinpoint the signal, you would need an antenna which has directionality. And then you would need to more or less uh, search for the signal with your device or have some kind of complex mechanism which does, does that for you. And for that reason, um, it's not usually done. Anyone has an idea why signal strength isn't used? Because if you, also if you know how far you were from the cell, then you could also, uh, get a more, more precise location estimation. Yes? Exactly. 
Exactly. So you might get quite a different different location actually just by walking into a building. You're five meters from your previous position, but the signal strength maybe drops by a, by a much higher factor just because of the shielding effects. So for these reasons, uh, all of these factors aren't usually used. Uh, just the the IDs are basically looked at. So uh, I'll illustrate that. So the the most simple approach would be I have one network cell and uh, now I know when I'm actually in, at this location, I'm connected, my device is connected to this network cell, then I must be somewhere within that radius. That's of course not yet very precise, so you can narrow it down. Um, if you know my device is connected to cell one, but I get also get a signal from cell two on a different frequency, which I can uh, maybe detect, even though I'm not connected there, then I can already narrow it down to the area which is covered by both cells at the same time. And uh, I've mentioned that already most, um, most uh, wide area base stations have several sectors. And then I can narrow it down even further. So I have cell one, I have cell two. For both of them, I know which sector I'm receiving and then I can get an even smaller estimate of my position. And um, yeah, due to the different size of the cells, uh, it's maybe still less accurate than GPS, but it can be sufficient, uh, for example, for navigation if I just know, need to know uh, which which road I need to make a turn, for example, then this may already be sufficient. Okay, so to wrap things up, uh, what are the issues with uh, cell-based location? Um, almost all of the queries which use cell-based uh, location are actually referring to the, the Google location database. Um, and every time that, that database is used, the, uh, the, the data I'm using to access it, like all the wireless access points, all the base stations I'm currently receiving, all of this is actually locked by Google. So, of course, they want to use that to improve their database, but it also um, has quite a lot of privacy implications because uh, maybe I have a, a wireless router which is not public, but if I use the location service somewhere in the area, then the, uh, the address of that router will still somehow be uploaded to Google. Um, there are other databases. There's Open Cell ID, which is just for cell towers. There's the Mozilla Location Database, which tries to cover both. But of course, they contain much less data than, uh, than the Google da database does. So if you just want um, as uh, precise as possible um, location update, then you will probably use the Google database. But you have to, to kind of pay for that with your, with your own data as usual. Um, this database is also quite large, so you can't use it if you actually want to be offline. So if you want to conserve data on your mobile device, then you can't use this method of location determination because you can't have the database locally on your device. It's much too large because it basically covers every cell tower and access point uh, worldwide. So uh, that's definitely a few, a few terabytes, I'd guess. Um, and what's also an issue is that some of the cells, especially Wi-Fi cells, can of course move around. So you uh, pick up your router, router and uh, borrow it to someone or you, you move to a different city and take your router with you. And so these, these cells can move, out, move around quite a lot and you need to, to update them from time to time. Of course, that's exactly what Google tries to do by just collecting all of the data all of the time and trying to incorporate that again into their database. So then they can pretty easily deal when just one device moves somewhere else, then um, that will, will quickly be reflected in the database because people will see it at the new location and then it will be, um, yeah, will be updated. All right, oh, yeah, question. One
um, it's usually uh, not. So if, if you are in a rural, rural area, then so that would be this scenario. And if you are on a wide open uh, uh, landscape, for example, then you might actually use, be able to use signal strength to at least estimate how far you are from the cell. Um, but as far as I know, most mobile devices don't do that. Um, so in that scenario, if you're just receiving one single cell, then um, you will get a very large uh, uh, estimate for your position simply because uh, there's no other data there. So it can just tell you the, the center of the, of the cell where the actual tower is located and the approximate uh, range where you can actually receive that cell. And if that's 10 kilometers, then there's no uh, well, in theory, you could use signal strength, but as far as I know, uh, current mobile operating systems simply don't do that. So for uh, uh, automated design, um, the assumption of where the current position is in the, in the two cells. Yeah, exactly. So it, with more cells, and of course in, in an urban area, you have much more. The more cells you get, the, the, the smaller the area gets where you can actually receive all of them. And uh, for that reason, you can easily get down to maybe 10 meters in an urban area with this method. But uh, in, in the open countryside, then it might go up to 10 kilometers easily, I guess. Okay, uh, other questions? Yes, please. What is it the cell size for the LTE? Um, it's even smaller than 3G, so there, I think, Usually not much larger than one kilometer, as far as I know. So you said that some countries are already discontinuing 2G, mm -hmm. and 2G had uh, a discovery of maximum of 35 you, Yes, so up to. What are they going to do in some areas which are not densely populated? So there will be like no network coverage in there? Well, either they, um, they will actually try to distribute large number of uh, larger number of 3G cells because 3G will still last for another 10 years or 20 years at least I guess um, or they actually say not worth the effort use a satellite phone um, I guess for example if you have large uh, countries like Canada for example I guess there even with 2G you, you get wide areas where you don't have any any coverage at all so Maybe some, I don't remember exactly which countries were planning that. Um, maybe if it's a country like uh, Singapore, then it would actually make sense because they have complete 3, 3G and 4G coverage anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, well, I, I think a country maybe like Canada will still wait a, a little longer with uh, phasing out 2G because it's easier to cover large areas, but if you're, just a small country, then it might already make sense. So, yes. Okay, so it's still it's still active. Okay. <laughs> Oops, I'm already far too far. Yeah, I think um, I think we'll skip the last part. I'll see if I can put that in um, next time. Otherwise, we'll run over time. So I think if there aren't any more questions up to here, um, no, then thanks for listening, and see you next week.